the second part of the inspirational coffee hour at the control department of Lund University. In the first part, I mainly talked about the millimeter wave channels and beam selection. In the second part, I will talk about channel estimation. Uh, this year, a new competition is launched and organized by a European Union called uh, International uh, Telecommunication Union, uh, which is mostly interested in standardizations. The competition is about artificial intelligence and machine learning in 5G networks. The competition has challenges about 40 topics in wireless networks. The topics range from coding and decoding of signals to beam selection, channel estimation and so on. For each chapter, there is a common test data that must be used by every team. Uh, the competition is offline, uh, that is, they give you a few months to submit your results. I have also noticed that there is another competition only for undergrad and grad students. Uh, this competition is online. Teams with 5-6 members sit at a desk with computers and other gadgets uh, they need for the competition. Then they try to solve a given problem in a few hours. Uh, in this work we propose a spatial estimation algorithm uh, to be used for the training of machine learning algorithms. Uh, in, uh, in this talk, uh, I will focus on only the sparse estimation part, not the machine learning part. Uh, as I mentioned in the first part of the presentation, channel estimation has been the conventional approach in wireless networks. However, with the advent of millimeter wave signals in 5G networks, beam selection has become an esteemed option for 5G networks. In 5G, we cannot use conventional channel estimation techniques anymore. Uh, we need sparse channel estimation techniques rather than conventional non-sparse channel estimation techniques. I believe another reason why a trivial beam selection is accepted in 5G standards is that there is still more research needed on sparse channel estimation techniques. Perhaps uh, we will see a sparse channel estimation approach in the next release of 5G standards. Uh, in our work we use an existing algorithm in the literature called uh, expectation maximization based sparse Bayesian learning via vector approximate message passing. Uh, this part will be discussed in detail at the next presentation because as you see here there are four different topics that need to be covered. Um, four different topics, expectation maximization, sparse Bayesian learning, approximate message passing and vector approximate message passing. So we will, I will cover these uh, topics in, in the next talk. In this talk I will give only an overview introduction to uh, approximate message passing. Uh, the next presentation might be ready in uh, about February. Again I will upload the videos and slides on the same link seen on the first page of this presentation. You can say that these uh, approaches are uh, statistical approaches uh, which are known on compressed sensing techniques. Uh, in this presentation I will talk why we need to do sparse channel estimation and why we can use compressed sensing techniques to achieve this. Then I will talk about the deterministic approaches such as LP minimization for sparse channel estimation. Finally, I will and I will end the talk with brief connections between deterministic and statistical approaches. Uh, in our work, we use the existing libraries written in MATLAB for the estimation part and TensorFlow for the machine learning part. In general, we follow the footsteps of Prof. Schneider and his colleagues uh, who has publications and open access libraries on these topics. Uh, the sparse Bayesian learning proposed by our Icarus uh, intelligent Self-Free Access for Wireless Ubiquitous Services team, sub, uh, sponsored by uh, WASP, uh, WASP, uh, which you can find the details on the first page. Uh, our team won second place at the uh, ITU competition. The team who won the third place also used sparse Bayesian learning. Uh, they uploaded a short version, short description of their proposal here. Uh, here it, on the slim. Uh, as far as I see, we could utilize some other features of millimeter wave channels as well, so we had the winning margin. Uh, and all presentations and
records uh, uh, of the teams that joined this competition are available in this link. Uh, I am also interested in WAMP, uh, where the messages are passed in vector forms, so that at every step you do vector updates instead of scalar updates. Uh, it, it is supposed to be in this way. And I like to work uh, with matrices and vectors. And another reason I chose WAMP is it's proposed by Prof. Schneider and his colleagues. I visited his lab for six months uh, on a Turkish scholarship during my PhD years. Uh, and I'm also uh, interested in Prof. Wen's work, uh, whom I met uh, in Taiwan uh, during uh, the times I was working there. Uh, so let me recap the first part of the talk from the last time, briefly. Y is a received signal vector, H is the channel matrix, X is the transmitted data vector, which is made of transmit beamform matrix and uh, data symbols. So this is an equation for data transmission in this slide. So we need to design U during the training phase, transmit beamforming matrix. So we can design U based on something other than channel information, which is called no CSIT, which I mentioned in the first part, or which can design you based on our channel, such as channel estimate. So this is called imperfect channel state information at transmitter, for instance. So to do this, uh, we send pilot signals, P, denoted by P. So then we have a beam forming matrix denoted by U sub P and a pilot symbols denoted by S sub P. So this P is known at both transmitter and receiver. Uh, uh, then uh, we can estimate the channel at the receiver because we know a YP and we know P then our only unknown is the H channel matrix and then once we estimate the channel uh, we can uh, design our U matrix based on this so let's have a brief look at uh, channel training options uh, assume we have downlink data transmission so acquisition of channel state information at the transmitter can be done in two ways in time division duplexing or frequency division duplexing in the tdd option mobile user and base station they transmit at the same frequency but they transmit at different time slots first mobile user sends training signals to the base station Base station estimates the channel and then designs this U beamform matrix and transmits its data signal at the time T prime. In the FTD version, base station a downlink we have downlink and uplink. Uh, I think I should have said like this, but uh, it's too late. Maybe downlink and uplink uh, transmissions happen at different frequencies but at similar times because uh, uh, there will be some time needed for the mobile user to do some operation. First, base station sends uh, training signals to the mobile user. Mobile user estimates the channel, quantizes the channel and sends this uh, quantized information back to the base station. So they're approximately done around similar times, but they use different frequencies in the uplink and downlink uh, transmission. So uh, for millimeter wave uh, channel uh, information acquisition, we have two options, beam training and channel training, as I mentioned before. Uh, and in this presentation, we are only interested in the first option, compressed sensing based sparse channel estimation. The second option is the conventional option and the last option is machine learning based option. Uh, and here in this slide, uh, uh, compressed sensing reconstruction algorithms are uh, detailed. So there are multiple options. And in this slide, I will go through only three categories, convex relaxation, Grid iterative algorithms and iterative threshold algorithms. Particularly, I will talk about 
basis per seat, basis per seat denoising, and lasso algorithms under the convex relaxation category. Only one algorithm, orthogonal matching per seat, under the grid iterative algorithm category, and there are yet many other matching per seat options, as is here, even more actually, not only this much. And uh, I will talk through the the simplest cases of iterative thresholding algorithms, which are soft and hard thresholding algorithms, and uh, the basic of the first, the simplest version of message passing algorithm, which is known as AMP, Approximate Message Passing Algorithm. Uh, in our work, uh, we use uh, these two particular cases, which are also uh, popular and uh, mostly used by the researchers for channel estimation, sparse Bayesian learning and belief propagation, which uh, I will briefly touch in this presentation. Uh, so what do we mean by sparse channels? In millimeter wave frequencies, the channel H is sparser. That is, the number of non-zero elements in the mat channel matrix H is much smaller than the number of zero elements in H. Uh, hence, uh, the channel estimation problem can be cast as a sparse signal uh, recover problem. Here I use the term sparse signal instead of sparse channel because uh, there are two different notations in compressed sensing, similar notations in compressed sensing and wireless communications. In wireless call, we use HX plus N. In compressed sensing, they use AX plus N. In compressed sensing, X is the unknown. In our case, H is the unknown. So we need to convert, uh, transform our equation to a CS format. So this H must be written uh, in terms of X as a vector. So since it is a vector, we can call it a signal. Uh, so we can also say sparse signal because uh, compressed sensing is applied to many fields starting from image processing. So I wanted to uh, talk about this in the beginning. Uh, so uh, sparsity does not manifest in the untinded domain. but in the angle domain. Uh, there is a typo here, let me quickly correct. Uh, sparsity does not manifest in the antenna domain, but manifests uh, in the angle domain. So I, I correct it immediately. So what do we mean by this? Uh, if you remember uh, uh, in the first part of the talk, we had a channel matrix H that contained the random complex numbers between the antennas of transmitter and receiver. So that H matrix in the spatial or antenna domain is not sparse. There is a number between at each uh, for each element. They are not zeros. However, if we move to the angle or frequency domain, we see that the channel matrix is sparse in these domains. Uh, so how do we move to a new domain? Uh, uh, I will talk about these figures later, we can focus on this first. Again, I had some uh, plot in the first part of the talk. We moved from time domain to spatial domain by just this C parameter. We talked about the wavelength notion of a signal. We said wavelength of a signal is C over F, speed of light divided by F. Wavelength is in meters. So uh, if you remove the C, uh, then you have a T. This is in meters, this is in uh, seconds, so we have the period of the signal. So, in short, I mean, uh, by a simple scalar, we, move, we transformed uh, our signal from time domain to signal domain, uh, to uh, spatial domain. So, it is kind of a similar transformation needed uh, to move from antenna domain to angular domain. Uh, so uh, we said uh, 
the channel is sparse in uh, angular domain and frequency domain. Let's see the uh, angular domain first. Here you see the magnitude of the channel matrix elements uh, on the y-axis and on the z-axis and on x and uh, y-axis you see the transmitter and receiver antenna indexes. So we have 60 antennas at the receiver and 60 antennas at the transmitter. So for instance, uh, this value here gives you the channel complex number between the 60th antenna transmitter and 60th receiver antenna. So absolute power of that, uh, absolute value of that uh, channel element. Now as you see, it is not sparse. They're all far from zero. So if we move to the uh, angular domain by some sort of transformation, which I denote by h to the s, s denotes sparsity here, then the matrix, the new matrix, uh, becomes sparse. As you see, the values are concentrated around two areas only. So uh, the reason for this is, I explain in the next slide, is scattering. So uh, at millimeter wave frequencies, the signals do not scatter much. So scattering means uh, our signal can multiply while traveling in the air, for instance, by bouncing off the walls, desks, etc. Uh, as a result, the same signal, one signal, arrives in multiple copies at the receiver via line of sight and via non-line of sight uh, paths. So these or these all other copies arriving at are arriving at the receiver due to these scatterers. So this figure can be considered to be microwave communications because the signal arrives at the destination via quite many number of multiple paths due to the rich scattering. Scattering is a good thing actually because we can benefit from multiple copies of the same signal by using multiple antennas. But as I said in the first part of the talk, we need to migrate to higher frequencies, then we need to have more directional signals in millimeter wave signals. That means, uh, that means at millimeter wave frequencies, uh, so these dashed lines uh, denote the microwave uh, frequency signals and the colored uh, solid lines denote the millimeter wave signals. So at millimeter wave frequencies, the signals are more directional. So that means there won't be much uh, scattering and the same signal will arrive at the destination, destination through a few paths only, maybe three as an example here. And these signals uh, will arrive naturally at different time slots because they travel at the same speed, speed of light, and their travel distances are different, so they arrive at the different time slots. So we have this delay spread notion, which means the difference between minimum and maximum time difference that these signals arrive at the destination. So usually it is set. Uh, to a value, uh, uh, so th the receiver needs to listen to the channel during this delay spread time. So in millimeter wave communications, uh, only few signals will arrive due to the uh, since there are not many scatters in the environment and uh, the signals will come through only a few paths. In microwave communications. There will be many signals arriving during the delay spread time. But then uh, in microwave communication, the, the delay spread time is longer. So we have a longer delay spread time. Uh, we have more uh, paths arriving at the receiver. But since we have a longer delay spread time, it's still stuck sparse in the delay domain. So in short, uh, millimeter wave signals are sparse in the angular domain. Millimeter and microwave signals, both of them are sparse in the delay domain. Uh, so we have talked about uh, sparsity in angular domain, in delay domain, and there uh, can be 
sparse in frequency domain which might be more familiar to you because if you take Fourier transform of a sinusoidal signal uh, we will get a minus and plus frequency terms after the Fourier transform so that means if we have a eight sinusoids uh, in time uh, when we take the Fourier transform we will have only eight positive frequency components in the frequency domain so as you see in the frequency domain the, the channel is sparse uh, Uh, so as you see here in the previous as you see here and in the previous slides in general By moving from one domain to another domain. We can find a sparse representation of a signal So there are also tutorial there is also a tutorial uh, there have been stories on the internet uh, I post those links time to time. So uh, let's see what compressed sensing has to do with uh, sparse signal estimation uh, we said in uh, compressed sensing literature, uh, our equation is usually written as yp ax plus n. So we need to transform our equation to this format. So in the CS jargon, uh, yp is the measurement observation vector, a is the measurement sensing matrix, x is the s sparse signal to be recovered. s sparse means the x vector has only s non-zero elements so it's l0 norm is s which is much smaller than n uh, l0 norm is a pseudo norm uh, because it does not obey uh, norm properties such as uh, constant scaling and uh, when m is much smaller than n uh, it is called compressed sensing uh, because uh, you have an n-dimensional signal and you are making only m observations which is much smaller than n so you are trying to estimate your n-dimensional signal in an n-dimensional space uh, which is much smaller so you are making kind of a compressing so this is possible only when we have a sparse signal s so uh, Let's have a look at this case uh, uh, virtually first, uh, I mean, uh, let's have a graph uh, to represent this case. Let's assume uh, we don't have a sparse system, let's assume our x vector is full, so its number of elements is n. So you here you see an underdetermined system, it's an ILPO system, there are infinitely many solutions. However, uh, uh, when we have a sparse signal, these uh, white uh, cells mean those are th there are those values those elements have zero values. Uh, the corresponding columns in the A matrix do not have effect on Y. So if we can pick columns that correspond to support of X, that is non-zero locations. Of the x vector, if I can find those columns, I can uh, uh, transform this underdetermined system to overdetermined system. So I show this in the next slide. So uh, we have a overdetermined system. We uh, we cannot recover uh, because it's imposed system. But if it is a uh, Uh, sorry, if we have an underdetermined system, we cannot recover it because it's an ill-posed solution. Uh, but we can recover an underdetermined system if the uh, x vector is sparse by picking up the columns uh, that matter for us. So we can just convert it to overdetermined system. So this technique is known as orthogonal. This technique is known as matching parseed algorithm in general because we pick the columns uh, that matter to us. 
So, uh, just a quick recap on overdetermined and underdetermined systems. If we have an overdetermined system and if we have a full rank, we can use Gaussian elimination. If, we, if it's not a full rank sensing matrix, we can use least square approximation. Uh, but if we have an underdetermined system, we can do L2 minimization uh, with this constraint. Uh, later we will see we don't like L2 uh, norm minimization uh, when the system is underdetermined and sparse. Uh, uh, okay, uh, but for this case, uh, I'm just talking about overdetermined and underdetermined system. What I'm saying is, uh, let's assume we don't know about complex sensing. Uh, I'm just recovering overdetermined and I'm just talking, uh, recovering, you know, I mean, uh, recapping uh, the overdetermined and undetermined systems. If overdetermined system, we can solve it. If it is underdetermined system, we can guarantee full recovery. Uh, with this kind of solution. So, uh, but if the X factor is sparse, uh, we can recover uh, underdetermined system uh, under some conditions. We will see. So let's see the last step. Uh, uh, let's see the uh, compressing uh, sense compressed sensing steps. Compressed sensing has three main steps: sparse representation. Uh, compressed sensing acquisition, measurement, observation, we can call all these, and compressed sensing reconstruction, recovery, estimation, we can all use this as well. First, uh, uh, we need to have a, sparse uh, have a sparse representation of H in a new domain. So both are unknown, but X is sparse. Next stage, uh, we need to measure uh, with few numbers of experiments. Yeah. And the last stage is the reconstruction stage. Uh, in the sparse, sparse representation stage, uh, the signal is represented as a projection on a suitable basis. That is uh, a linear combination of only S basis vectors with S being much smaller than N. In other uh, words, uh, the original signal H can be uh, represented with a basis of n by 1 PC column. So we need to find an n by n basis matrix for a sparse representation, in short. In the second stage, uh, the measurement is issued by the phi matrix, which is an n by n matrix. And in the last stage, uh, we do the recovery. Uh, in the last stage, first we estimate the sparsely represented signal given the observation NA. And from this X estimate, we can recover the ultimate goal H estimation of the channel H because we know this uh, basis matrix we can recover H hat, which is our ultimate goal. So uh, sometimes we can do sparse approximation. Uh, also, we can use this in uh, other cases. If we see some very small values, uh, we can just get rid of them. We can uh, make them equal to zero. So uh, here by rolling these small values to zero, we have a sparse representation of H, which is a very simple idea, but I wanted to mention. So here in this slide and next slide, I want to clarify a bit the confusion between the notations for wireless communication and CS literature. We have received that the signal notations here, y equal to hx plus n. We have received training signal notations here, yp pilot signal, hp pilot signal, p is pilot signal, hp plus n. If we continue in the next slide, uh, we need to restructure this received training signal in the CS format, which in this case we have X as unknown. So we need to rewrite uh, X in terms of H function and A also must be in terms of uh, 
pilot signals. So we need to do this transformation. Just for your reference, I wanted to keep y is equal to ax notation because it is widely uh, used in CS literature. I didn't want to use another notation just to make a differentiation between this and that a, that x. I think it's clear. So just to remind, remind uh, m and n number of are a number of receive and transmit antennas. Uh, so in fact, uh, we can increase our training time to have an overdetermined system. Uh, as a simple example, consider a messy MIMO case where number of transmitter antennas is very large and receiver antennas is only one. So this is a MISO case, multiple input single output, but it's called messy MIMO for some reason. Uh, so this is our received training signal. In this case, it's a bit different. P is a matrix this time, which is T by N, because we have training signals uh, transmitted at each time slot. And we have for the same channel H, which is M by N, M by 1, between transmitter and receiver. So what we can do is we can do many training time slot such as it is larger than the number of n. So we have an overdetermined system. But this is a waste of resources because uh, as I mentioned in the first part of the talk, we have a coherence time. During this coherence time, the channel is constant. And uh, during the coherence time, we need to do the training first and then data transmission. If we do too many, too much, if we spend too much resources on training, we won't have enough resources for data transmission and we will lose uh, speed. Bits per second per hertz will be low. So we cannot have many training time slots. So we, uh, we need to compress sensing techniques. Uh, so otherwise it will be a waste of resources. So let's try to have a sense of what we have in millimeter wave communication channels. Uh, to have more info about these equations, you can have a look at equations from 8 to 13 in this publication. Let's assume we have capital T number of training time slots. And this is again our uh, compressed sensing equation. So we will receive training signals capital T times. So we have Y1 until Y2, Yt. So we, we, we have observation matrix T times because it's observation matrix. We are doing measurements with it. But we have only one PC matrix because it's a sparse representation matrix. We, do, we, can, we just need to do one time sparse representation. So when we can stack all these equations into one equation, of course. So in the end, uh, we have Tm much smaller than n. And we, we need compress sensing uh, for this case. So in millimeter wave channels, this equation corresponds to these parameters, actually. T times LR is much smaller than GT times GR. LR is the number of RF chains at the receiver. GT and GR uh, are the grid sizes at the transmitter and receiver. I think I forgot to mention one thing at uh, one of the presentations. Unfortunately, uh, uh, I think I need to go to that presentation slide. So here uh, you see uh, we have 60 by 60 uh, angular domain grid. Uh, so we can also call it bins or grid. Uh, here what's being done here, for instance, let me give an example briefly. Let's say transmitter is covering 180 degrees, angular degrees, right? So the transmitter can use 60 bins. So each bin corresponds to 3 degrees. So we are discretizing the angular domain, which is actually continuous, which is infinite, which has infinite number, 
which has infinite infinite number of values, but we need to discretize it. So we are discretizing into 60 pins. So in the end we have a 60 by 60 grid. So I forgot to uh, mention this. Uh, so we can go back to slide, uh, which is here. So that G, this GTM GR are those grid sizes. Um, in that slide, the numbers were 60. I think they were not good options. I think they should have been 64. I think they are 64. Sorry, they are 64. It's just uh, 60. Uh, the index points are marked at 10, 20. So there are 64 antennas there. So uh, again, a grid or bin uh, means discretizing the angular domain. So we are approximate the continuous angular space domain in millimeter wave signal. So my point here is eventually the, the typical values for these parameters are for instance 20, 40, 80, that is the number of training time slots. Number of RF chains cannot be many, that's the purpose. We want to keep number of RF, RF chains uh, low, which I didn't mention in the first part or in this talk, that means hybrid transmitter and receiver antennas, so they're also low, LR is also low, whereas GTGR can be high. So in the end, uh, this number is much smaller than this number. So in millimeter wave channels, we need compressed sensing techniques. Uh, so in this slide, uh, we get into the last step, recovery step. So I use the CS form of equation y equal to ax plus n. So again, uh, we know these uh, notations already. So to obtain a sparse signal solution, uh, the intuitive solution to do is, assuming we don't have any noise, to obtain the sparsest x solution, that is we want to minimize the L0 norm. We, we want to minimize the number of non-zero elements in the x so that the equal to y equal to x we are assuming there's no noise is equality satisfied so this is l0 minimization again l0 norm is a pseudo norm because it doesn't satisfy the scaling constant constraint so it basically counts the number of non-zero elements in a vector so uh, this is a combinatorial problem we need to choose and choose S combinations because X has S non-sparse elements and also in fact here I'm assuming we know S uh, we may not know S also so we need to do and choose S combination of trials here which is uh, MP hard which is impractical for easily which can be impractical very easily plus we may not know S so we can do convex relaxation. So we can use L1 uh, norm instead of L0 norm. And this problem is known as uh, basis person. So now two questions arise. How well uh, uh, does this L1 norm solution solve this problem compared to L0 norm solution? And the other question is, does a one norm solution promote or provide sparsity? The short answer uh, to these questions are positive. Uh, under some conditions, a one norm solution can recover the exact L0 norm solution. And a one norm solution provides sparsity. We will get into the details. Uh, how about L2 norm solution? No, L2 norm solution does not provide sparsity. Uh, we will get into the details as I said. So let's look at the first question in a bit more detail now. So uh, how good can L1 minimization be compared to the L0 minimization which gives you the optimal result but which is also amply complete. Uh, it is proved that the sensing matrix A need to satisfy this constraint which is we need to find the smallest delta so that any s by s sub matrix of a is nearly 
isometric. This means the sensing matrix which compresses the domain from N to M, which is much smaller than N, should not alter the L2 norm of X much. Or if we look uh, in this representative figure, uh, we can also say that when we shrink the domain from N to M, these S-dimensional subspaces x and x prime, x vector and another vector, when they are transformed into the new domain by the sensing matrix, in the new domain these uh, vectors should not overlap or should not get close to each other. So uh, that's the idea of uh, RIP condition. Of course, checking this condition is also not easy because we need to do combinatorial check. But it is also proven that if you work with uh, probabilistic sensing matrices such as Gaussian, when this condition is satisfied, uh, it is proven that uh, A matrix, uh, uh, the probability of A matrix satisfying this condition get close to one quickly. So uh, there are two good news here. One is we just need to uh, know, I mean, our only design concentration is the size of the matrix. And uh, M is much smaller than N. Uh, it is, M is log of N. So assume we have, that means M is much smaller than M. Assume we have log base 10 of 10 to the 6 then we get only 6 as a result. So 6 is much smaller than 10 to the 6. So the compression is huge. So uh, in terms of recovery, is the answer is positive. So uh, in the literature, uh, you can find... Uh, so A is a design problem. So we need to design this matrix. Uh, there is a design problem either in a deterministic or in a random field, uh, which I don't get into the details. So how about sparsity? Does L1 norm provide sparsity? So we will look into these uh, famous drawings in complex sensing literature. Let's assume we have one ob observation and two variables only. So in this case, our sparsity solution must uh, provide us only one non-zero variable. The other variable must be zero. So in this case, we have this uh, optimization problem. Here you see the contours, four contours that correspond to different LP norms. For that correspond to LP norms for different p values. First of all, let me say that these these straight lines are same. They correspond to this condition y equal to ax condition and these are the uh, cost contours so when we have p larger than 2 1 uh, we have this figure as you know when we have p equal to 2 we have a circular so the solution exists when the two of them meet so when we have p equal to 2 case for instance it's circular and we are never likely to get a, a sparse solution as you see, they, they touch here, uh, we will have x1 and x2 values. The solution won't be sparse. P is a special case with the good properties. Uh, except these cases, four cases, L1 norm is likely to bring us sparse solution. Uh, here you see a LP norm when is P is between 0 and 1, as you see, as P gets closer to 0, the solution gets sparser. However, LP norm between 1 and 0 is not convex. It can bring a sparser solution, but the problem is not convex to solve. Uh, so L1 norm is the most preferred uh, relaxation for the solution of this problem. So uh, in this uh, article, you can find 
more discussions about the properties of LP norm and other things about compressing. Uh, you can check these links too. In the last link, MATLAB link, uh, you can find a MATLAB code uh, to plot these contours or balls in 2D and 3D. Uh, so you can check those links. So when we have a noise, we can uh, relax the constraint by L2 norm, so we can let be a margin of error. And we can write this in an unconstrained form, like range form. And this optimization problem is known as basis per denosing or least absolute shrinkage and selection operator problem, which are similar but different. Uh, for that, you can check this equation, uh, the thesis. Sorry. So eventually we are interested in this unconstrained version of the problem because we said L1 norm provides sparsity and uh, L1 norm provides sparsity and uh, we can uh, get uh, solutions we said in, uh, earlier. So, uh, so we will see that uh, in this presentation to solve this unconstrained uh, problem, uh, BPDN or Lasso problem, we can use greedy iterative algorithms, iterative thresholding algorithms, and I will touch only the four of these. And uh, so, linear programming solutions are good, but they are costly for higher dimensional problems. Greedy solutions are cheaper than LP solutions. Can, they can be cheaper, but they are still complex for high dimensional problems. We are talking about uh, huge dimensions here. So thresholding algorithms are more suitable for high dimensional problems. So that's why we are interested in these uh, algorithms in compressed sensing more. So first, uh, let me go through uh, one simple case of greedy algorithms, orthogonal matching per set. I will try to explain this in five steps. So first we start uh, by uh, assigning the residual vector to received observed vector. This is residual vector. Here we see at iteration i, residual vector is equal to observed signal minus uh, y sub i hat which means y sub i hat is equal to estimated signal at step i times sub matrix of a sensing matrix sub matrix of sensing a at step i so what is this sub matrix of a so basically for matching person algorithms we pick the columns as i said before we pick the columns of a OMP picks one by one. So at step i, we pick the column of A, stack it into submatrix denoted by A sub i, that means submatrix A at iteration i. So we keep stacking these picked columns and the submatrix A i keeps growing. So uh, we initialize the residual with the observed signal. And the first step is to check each column of the sensing matrix A. So AN denotes the nth column. There are total capital N number of columns in uh, sensing matrix A. So we check the correlation of this residual vector with uh, each column. So the highest correlation number will give us the non-zero location of the X vector. So we can interpret this step as follows. Uh, assume that the normal of each column of A is nearly 1. If the x vectors has large numbers such as 100 and small numbers close to 0, then the correlation coefficient will be high for the column of A that corresponds to a large number in X. Here I also put a simple experiment file that illustrates uh, this step only. Uh, after finding that column, 
that gives us the highest correlation number, we stack this column into submatrix A. And now we have an overdetermined system because we are picking up the columns. So we have an overdetermined system. The original sensing matrix gives us underdetermined system, but we are picking up the columns. So we have overdetermined system, so we can make an estimation of x. Where here, uh, this is a pseudo inverse operation. We can do least square estimation. So after we get the estimated x we update our residual and uh, we, iterate, we can iterate until the residual is very small or uh, if we know the number of uh, if no if we know the s parameter which is the number of uh, non-zero elements in x we can continue iterate until that s number is reached so it is called orthogonal matching person because a uh, residual vector is already orthogonal to is orthogonal to already selected uh, columns of a at each step so uh, we don't select the same column in the next step uh, so of course we can also achieve this by keeping a track of selected columns that's another option so this is OMP algorithm, it's a greedy approach uh, and there are other variations of matching persons such as you can choose multiple columns at each step and uh, there are many other options in the future. So far we have seen complex, convex relaxation and greedy strategies. We saw that linear programming algorithms or parser algorithms can be used. Uh, so we said uh, greedy strategies are faster than LP solutions, but greedy strategies are, can still be slow for large size problems. So iterative threshold algorithms can be preferred over greedy algorithms because they are very simple. And they rely on a very basic naive idea, in fact. So the simplest iterative threshold algorithms are iterative hard and iterative soft threshold algorithms. Uh, so there are two steps in these algorithms. The first step is the gradient descent step and the second step is the thresholding step. So first let me introduce the thresholding functions used in the second step. So uh, you can find two notations in the literature. This is more common used. This is used in Schneider et al's papers or Schneider's papers briefly. So uh, Eta denotes the thresholding function, capital T denotes the thresholding function, sometimes S is used to denote soft thresholding function. So R is the input vector and sigma is the threshold parameter. We have two thresholding functions, hard and soft. Hard thresholding function passes the input directly if the input is larger than the threshold, otherwise it knows it. Whereas a soft thresholding shrinks the input if it is larger than the threshold and otherwise most uh, input. So it's, that's why it's called also shrinkage because it shrinks the input by a value of uh, sigma. Um, so here in these plots you see x set. Uh, and here you see the input Rn. So when Rn is between minus long, sigma and plus sigma, it is null in the hard thresholding. If it is larger, it just passes as it is. So this line crosses from the origin. So it's shown x and hat because this is the second step. In the second step, we just get the x estimation. So that's why it's x hat. That's as simple as it is. The first step is gradient. The second step is just a threshold. Uh, I also want to mention one thing about in Schneider's papers, uh, they might prefer to use this notation because uh, in probabilistic settings, it it even comes maybe from casebook. I don't know. Uh, when we talk about the probability distribution of x, we write p of x, as you know. 
Uh, and when we want to specify that the PD of fx is dependent of a parameter sigma, we write P of x semicolon sigma. So we separate the parameters, we put the parameters after the semicolon. Or if you want to write the posterior probability of x, we write P of x given y, again after the semicolon we put sigma. P of x given i semicolon sigma. I think uh, they wanted to have the same harmony in the notations, that's why they have different notations in our field, uh, single processing field, wireless communications field. So, uh, another thing I would like to talk about, uh, as I said, the iterative thresholding schemes are naive approaches because uh, they rely on a simple assumption that the input to the thresholding function is the true signal plus a noise. So by thresholding, we are trying to remove out the noise to be left with the true signal. So it's a very naive, uh, optimistic approach. Uh, therefore, uh, they're also called Denisov-based algorithms because we are trying to remove out that noise. Uh, we can use more complex denosers than hard and soft threshold functions, we will see later. And the term denoser is usually used, is mostly used in probabilistic settings. Uh, I, I will get into that later. Uh, so, ISTA is in fact the proximal gradient descent algorithm when we have convex sets. Because uh, uh, here uh, you see uh, the least term function g of x which is convex and differential here you see the L1 norm which is convex but non-differential uh, since uh, h of x is non-differential we cannot directly apply graded descent algorithms we can therefore apply we therefore need to use proximal mapping of the h function instead uh, that's the l1 norm we need to do proximal mapping on l1 norm so uh, this approach this is x set as you see uh, you get x set in just one line first you do graded descent and then you do prox uh, proximal mapping so you you start uh, with your point you move along the minus minus of the gradient minus grad minus gradient of your g function and then you do proximal operator on your h function uh, so uh, the result of this uh, of this problem is the well known problem uh, so is the well known solution soft thresholding with parameter beta lambda there are two notations here so here we should have 1 over 2 if we are in real domain uh, but I, here I'm assuming complex so it is only 1 over beta lambda uh, so again uh, this ISTA is a very uh, naive approach uh, again uh, I'm repeating here the same equations and here I, uh, I'm using some uh, illustrations to uh, show soft thresholding and hard thresholding. Here, as you see, we get close to the axis slowly. Here, uh, you get immediately to the uh, axis uh, to stress out that uh, here we are doing hard thresholding, here we are doing soft thresholding. So, uh, so here uh, in the slide, uh, I want to move from deterministic setting to random setting. Maybe this slide is not so needed, but I will go through it briefly. So I want to give an intuitive explanation roughly before moving on to the AMP algorithm. Because AMP is right in the probabilistic setting, so we assume uh, we have a random sensing matrix A. 
uh, in random setting it's easier to discuss uh, so as I said before by applying the shrinkage function to the input uh, we implicitly assume that our input to the shrinkage function is the true signal denoted by x0 here plus noise so we are assuming our input which is actually this one to the shrinkage function should be like true signal plus noise so when we proximal map uh, we can uh, remove out the noise uh, so uh, first uh, let's assume no noise case so our observation is just y equal to ax there is no n so if a is orthonormal we can recover x at the first step by applying a Hermitian y but if it's not uh, orthonormal uh, we cannot recover it so to uh, show this we can e equivalent write like this so if uh, uh, we if a is orthonormal uh, our bx0 will be zero so we can try terminate if not bx0 will not be zero and there will be hopefully some there will be some true signal plus uh, noise so as i said if we can uh, know this uh, noise power uh, bx0 norm square we can set our threshold accordingly so we can remove it but let's assume uh, we don't know it and we get some estimate uh, which close gets us closer to the x0 value and in step two uh, we will uh, use this uh, estimate obtain the uh, residual and apply a hermitian and we can write this again rewrite this in this format uh, when again a is orthonormal this term will be zero if not it won't be zero and it will be a uh, true signal plus noise and here our noise is this time this term which is has a smaller value than the first step so at next iteration iteration we will have a smaller noise so this will uh, iterate in this manner so this is the sense of uh, why uh, iterative threshold methods can work in the from the term uh, from probabilistic perspective uh, so uh, so therefore we can think our eta function as a denizer function uh, and then yes we can have uh, denizer functions borrowed from image processing image denizer applications we can use them for our wireless communications applications as well we will see later now let me introduce the AMP algorithm and to compare with ISTA and AMP side by side easier uh, let's write let's use the residual VI in the formulations so uh, for the same last problem uh, we can use ISTA or AMP so AMP here, as you see, almost similar to the ISTA. It is made of two steps only, but there are two differences. One difference is it has on Sager correction term. Second difference is its thresholding is iteration dependent. It changes at each, at each iteration based on the residual. Uh, so RI is also sometimes called pseudo data because it's kind of a true data plus noise uh, it can also be called shrinkage or threshold input uh, so here at this point I want to talk about the AMP algorithm by words only so uh, these steps are drive through AMP technique in a probabilistic setting for ISTA we don't have such a probabilistic derivation Message passing techniques, also known as belief propagation techniques, are for higher dimensional problems. Therefore, under higher dimensional problems, we can do approximations in the probabilistic setting, such as by using the central limit theorem. Uh, AMP algorithm is proven to be accurate in the large system limit when n 
over n converts to a constant as m n and scale to infinity uh, and I will get into these details uh, in the next presentation, not in this presentation. So, but for now, uh, we can learn that these steps are derived from a probabilistic perspective by using the AMP technique. So, some presentation tutorial, there is more actually. Uh, but I think you can find those others uh, from these presentations. So what is the benefit of Onsager correction term? So there's a main question here. Our main assumption, the input to the threshold function should be true signal plus noise. The input, which is this term, is it really true signal plus noise? Or in other words, Input minus true signal, which gives us the noise, does it behave like Gaussian? Very cool. So, uh, the authors proposed this uh, approach by showing numerical evidences, and in the follow up, they had more rigorous support, more rigorous e uh, evidences. So, here you see QQ plots of two algorithms, ISTA and AMP, and as they know, there's BM3D denoiser filters are used, not simple threshold filters. These fil denoiser filters are borrowed from image denoising filters. Uh, I will get into that later. So, QQ plot means there's a red line here, 45 degrees. So, if these blue sample points lay more on this X, the red line, that means this distribution, whatever we are observing, is more Gaussian. So here, as you see, when we have ISTA, uh, it, on the edges, uh, they diverge from the red point, whereas AMP, they're more on the red point. So that means AMP has more Gaussian distribution. Because remember that VI term has also a correction for AMP, whereas ISTA doesn't have. Here it's just written IT. It, it is ISTA. So again, this is QQ plot of standard normal deviation versus uh, input minus true signal, which should behave as Gaussian if it is really Gaussian. If these algorithms are working on these inputs, which should be Gaussian, uh, no, uh, true signal plus Gaussian, if this basic assumption is true, true signal, uh, input minus true signal should be Gaussian. And here we see that AMP satisfies it, but uh, ISTA cannot. I mean, cannot satisfy it as good as AMP. So, uh, uh, AMP can be defined for any Lipschitz quantity free. Lipschitz continuous shrinkage function. So we can find uh, the uh, shrinkage function uh, for other uh, functions. So here, uh, this is the basic AMP algorithm, which is using soft thresholding. Uh, here uh, it can be any shrinkage function and this time we need to evaluate B in terms of uh, differentials, partial differentials. So there are many uh, notations in the literature for partial differential, either eta prime, divergence or partial differentials. Uh, so. Uh, Here, I'm basically repeating what I have said before. And uh, in the next slide, I will talk about uh, evaluating the divergence for different types of shrinkage functions. So, for many denoiser functions, it's not easy to evaluate the divergence, so we need to uh, get help from Monte Carlo simulations. So, in practice, to evaluate the divergence, of uh, to a divergence of the shrinkage function, we can generate 
normal distributions multiple uh, we can generate multiple times of this normal distribution and we evaluate the divergence for each generation for a very small epsilon value and then we average these uh, divergence evaluations so that's how we can uh, find uh, approximate divergence value of a shrinkage function if there is no closed form solution so if r is high dimensional the input that we are trying to pass through the shrinkage function if r is already high dimensional uh, usually only one time generation is sufficient capital C is one is sufficient so uh, here uh, I want to talk uh, briefly about something uh, so uh, so far we have been only discussing denoising based algorithms such as AMP, ISTA, AMP, BM3D or other denoises with AMP because again all of them rely on the simple assumption that the input to the denoising function is true signal plus a Gaussian noise because in this presentation we have only focused on the linear model which is y equals to ax plus n AMP is later extended to a more general setting known as generalized linear model in the GLN the input has a distribution it is called period distribution again in GLM there is also likelihood probability distribution for the observed measurement wire vector so we are in a Bayesian setting so we can also call this Bayesian GLM so the extension of AMP to Bayesian GLM is known as generalized AMP again uh, we will talk about these in the next presentation uh, in this and the next slides, I will briefly show that in fact the deterministic approaches we have seen so far have probabilistic correspondences and I will end after this. Uh, so again we can assume uh, uh, we can assume this slide is an entry to Bayesian inference models. Perhaps we can assume this as an entry. Uh, let's assume uh, again we have a linear model x plus n with the Gaussian noise. So given x and noise power, we can find the local likelihood function uh, as Gaussian again with mean ax and variance uh, identity matrix times uh, sigma square. So maximum likelihood estimate of x can be obtained by, by minimizing over x arg mean of over x of minus log of uh, likelihood function. So minus log of likelihood function is a constant plus least square term. So this is a least square problem. C plus least square. This is exactly a least square problem. So if we can also assume we have a prior distribution, we might have an idea about the distribution of the input and uh, we might know that this distribution is dependent on the variable parameter v so we might know period distribution of x given v and here I use Laplace step distribution uh, oh sorry uh, Yes, I will talk it about in the next slide. So, Laplace distribution, uh, Laplace distribution corresponds to a one norm, as you see here. So, uh, but uh, before that, uh, I need to introduce the posterior posterior distribution of x as well. So, posterior distribution of x by by using Bayes theorem, we can write it as equal to likelihood function times prior distribution and if you take the uh, minus log of this uh, posterior distribution we can find the maximum posterior estimate which gives us again a constant plus this square term plus L1 norm 
So we just obtained B BDPN and lots of uh, problems. So as you see, uh, Laplace distribution corresponds to L1 norm. So as you see in the slide, the deterministic approaches has cores have correspondences in probabilistic domain. Uh, so we can have these prior distributions, Gaussian, Laplace, and student T, and these are their plots, Laplace and student T. Student T a corresponds to LP norm, where P is between 0 and 1. Laplace corresponds to L1 norm. Gaussian corresponds to L2 norm. As you see here, Gaussian distribution. Uh, so he here are their posteriors. So posteriors of Laplace and very, uh, student T are skewed towards the axis they're trying to sparsify and uh, certainty is very sparse giving you very sparse solutions but it is not low concave because uh, this is that concave plot or they're not convex and Gaussian is not giving us any uh, sparse solutions just giving us uh, equal distributed variables so uh, for this reason uh, we prefer Laplace uh, distribution in our probabilistic analysis in Bayesian inference uh, because it is uh, convex and it's, it also gives us sparse solutions so in this slide and next slide I won't talk about because I'm just basically going through uh, fundamentals and these are all theoretical things we cannot apply them in uh, real life in real problems so in the next presentation, I would like to start from the basic theory. Uh, I, want, I plan to start from case statistical signals books. Then I will step by step move towards the realistic signals. Uh, I will explain Bayesian inference, Bayesian learning, expectation maximization, message passing algorithms, and so on. So I would like to stop here. Maybe I should have mentioned the intention of this presentation in the beginning. Uh, so my suggestion is to go through all links and references provided in this presentation. This presentation is a blend of all the resources. In fact, uh, in these resources, you can understand more and clearer about the intuitions I tried to explain. You can find more connections in the theories at high levels. Of course, for the transaction and thesis resources I provided in this presentation, you can find the two full details. And these resources will lead you to many other available resources as well. And during the presentation, sometimes I shared resources just because of the copyright issues, uh, because I borrowed their figures. I think you can identify them. In the first part of the talk that I gave, uh, this happened uh, much more often. Maybe in the second part, uh, uh, maybe only one or two times I just used uh, some references maybe that may not interest you much. So in short, in this presentation, I try to touch many points in a short time, I guess not really short time, for the purpose that this presentation might be a stepping stone for you to move on to those references I provided. Thank you for listening.